Blog Talk Radio. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of the Business Core Show. Today, our special guest is Mark Ryan, managing partner with uh, Easy8A.com. Mark, welcome to the program. Good morning. Welcome. Thanks, Tim. Great. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how to get certified with the SBA and what is 8A. So, I guess to just go ahead and begin where we'll dive right into it. Uh, Mark, what is 8A? The 8A certification is a certification given out by the federal government, the Small Business Administration specifically. It is a a certification that the government has designed with the intention of helping them help minority or what they call socially disadvantaged businesses get uh, preferential treatment in doing government contracting. Okay. The, uh, yeah, I can get to go back in time a little bit. You know, they they developed the program in the late '60s, and you know, it's gone through some different iterations over the years. But ultimately, you know, its its intent is to help companies that are owned by individuals who are socially and economically disadvantaged, and to give them preferential treatment in, in the government contracting. That preferential treatment comes in two major ways. The the first way is that it allows the companies that have the 8A certification to get a dollar-type preferential treatment. So, you know, if they're bidding against a non-8A company, the government can give them anywhere from 10 to 20% price preference over the competitor. So, you know, if you're putting in a bid for $100,000, the government will evaluate it as if it was $90,000 before they would compare that bid to a competing firm that was a non-8A firm. The second type of preferential treatment that you get is the is the sole sourcing, and when they do sole sourcing, that is where the government simply calls you up and negotiates a contract with you without ever putting it out for bid. So, you know, in that scenario, your competitors don't even ever know that the opportunity exists or that they missed the contract because you had the 8 day certification and you had the relationship with the contracting officer, and they simply called you up and gave you the job. Wow, is that easy? So that is, you know, that is really why people get 8A certified. They want to be able to do that sole sourcing. Unfortunately, you know, it doesn't just fall in your lap. You know, you you have to get 8A certified, which isn't easy, and then you have to have a relationship with a contracting officer where they have the comfort level, you know, in your product or service that they're willing to do that for you. So usually our clients, you know, will get them 8A certified, and it might be two, three years later before they get their first sole source contract. But then what they do is is that's about all they do for the rest of their nine years in the program is, you know, they'll do a lot of sole source work, and and usually you find out that that becomes uh, the largest portion of their revenue is, is getting sole source government work. Wow. So we're not talking about really a lot of money because – are there a lot of, not sole source, but a lot of 8A certified companies out there? There are. There's 9,400 of them, 9,400 and change. So okay. there's a lot of 8A companies. I mean, it, you know, I say that's a lot. Obviously, it's a tiny, tiny portion of the uh, of the, go- the companies out there doing government contract contracting. So it, it's very hard to get. The, the average 8A company uh, does about $1.5 million a year in, in 8A work. So, you know, there's, there's a significant... Um, your revenue stream that you should be able to realize by by just getting that certification. So overall, I and mean, when you add all this together, it's really less than a billion dollars that's been pretty much allocated or been used out of federal dollars in order to uh, for those companies to take have that particular treatment. 
So do you know, on average, you mentioned it's like $1.5 million. Do you know if all 9,400 companies are active? If not, why they're not active? Is it because of the comfort level with the uh, contracting officers or they're not trying hard enough? Or kind of give us an idea about that. If you A lot of companies will get 8A certified and never do anything with the certification. You know, So they'll never make an effort to reach out to contracting officers, let them know they're out there, or they will never go out you know, to Fed biz ops or, or another resource like that and start bidding on government work. And you know, ultimately, you know, like any business development, if you don't put anything into it, you're not going to get anything out of it. So I, I would, and, and this is just an estimate from my experience, but about a quarter of the clients that I help get 8A certified, I talk to them a year, two years later, and they're not doing any work with it. Uh, and about half of them I speak to, and they're doing a million or two million a year. And then another quarter that I speak to, you know, they're doing four or five million a year. So, you know, you, you do see it all over the board for sure, Tim. Wow. So, so the whole process for 8A certification, what type of process did they go through? The application, how long does it take? Our applications get rejected. Can you give us an overview on how that process works? There's two things that would be probably helpful to go through with you, Tim, and, and that's what the SBA is looking for to qualify a firm and then to, to kind of walk you through the, the application process like you've suggested. I think I'll attempt to do the second one, and then we'll, we'll talk about the qualifications. The application is a significant application. The SBA, all, all they've done over the last 35 years is add more and more regulations to this program. So, you know, typical applications, three or four inches thick, it'll have years of financial statements and tax returns and corporate minutes and bylaws and resumes and contracts and invoices and, uh, you know, teaming agreements and a lot of personal financial information information in it. So it's a significant undertaking, a lot of technical writing in it. You'll submit that to the to the uh, SBA and they'll take about three months to approve it. So, you know, it, it's it's a slow process and it's it's an involved application. To, uh, to, to kind of back up a little bit and talk about what the SBA is looking for, the SBA, he has, you know, at the most basic level, what the SBA is looking for is a company that's a good candidate for the program, and then they want that company to be owned, what they call unconditionally controlled, by an individual who's also a good candidate for the program. So they'll talk about the company. They're looking for the company to have what they call a potential for success, and then they're looking for that unconditionally controlling owner to be economically disadvantaged and to be socially disadvantaged. So those are the kind of the big three areas that we'd want to talk about in trying to qualify an individual for, you know, for a certification or for, for a listener to get a good comfort level that they, you know, that they may be a good candidate. Um, if it makes sense, Tim, I can talk about those three areas. Absolutely. All right. When the SBA is evaluating the unconditionally controlling owner to be socially disadvantaged, they like for that person to be a member of what they call a presumed disadvantaged group. That means that that individual is either African American, Hispanic American, subcontinent Asian, Asian Pacific American, or Native American. That type of application makes up a little over 98, that's 98.4, almost 98.5% of all 8A firms. Okay. So that is the typical way to get AA certified is by being a minority, and by being a minority, we're talking 25% or more of your blood is of that of that minority group. And however, it's not the only way to show that you are socially disadvantaged. You can also show that you're socially disadvantaged through what's called a preponderance of evidence of chronic discrimination of some type. The most common two are gender bias and handicap bias. Okay. So it is possible for a Caucasian female to get 8A certified by, you know, we if you were using our services, we'd write a narrative or, the, you know, the applicant would, would write a narrative. It's typically about a 10-page long document that talks about why, in this case, why she would be disadvantaged because of her gender. That narrative basically needs to talk about different incidences that has happened to that individual since they've been running their company and in prior aspects of their life that would lead credence to them being discriminated against because of that, that gender or that handicap. Uh, the most common handicap is a disabled American vet, and that's that's a common thing because you have when they're discharged from 
of the military or on any sort of annual, uh, you know, review or whenever they request a review, they get something called a DD-214, which is a, a form that where the government gives them a percentage disability rating. And if that disability rating is high enough, the minimum is 30 percent, but, you know, the SBA really likes to see it higher than that, 60, 80, 100 percent. If that rating's high enough and, and you have a compelling narrative, then, uh, you know, in that case, it could be a, a white guy can get 8A certified, you know, if they're handicapped and the discrimination they're experiencing because of that handicap, uh, you know, merits that social disadvantage. So that's the first half of the unconditionally controlling applicant. They need to be socially disadvantaged, and almost all of them do it by a presumed group type application. The other half is that that, that unconditionally controlling applicant has to be economically disadvantaged. To be economically disadvantaged means that you have three criteria that you meet. You have to have less than $4 million in assets, the second criteria is that you have less than a quarter million dollars in adjusted net worth. And the third criteria is that you are, have been earning less than a quarter million dollars a year in personal income. Each of those three criteria are to the applicant, him or herself, not to the applicant and their spouse. So when the SBA looks at an applicant's tax return, you know, and the spouse made 100000 the applicant made 100000 they're only going to be looking at the applicant's portion and say, okay, the applicant's portion is under the $250,000, they qualify. Then, you know, so your spouse could, you know, have a lot of assets, or you and your spouse combined could have $5 million in assets, but your portion is only $2.5 million, so you're under the $4 million threshold. Mm-hmm. The middle one that I've kind of skipped around here, this adjusted net worth, is a, a, a little funny, but what the SBA is calculating here is your net worth, but they're doing that calculation without giving any value to the equity, whether it be plus or minus equity in your primary residence, the value that you have in any retirement accounts, or the equity that you have in the applicant concern. So the really what they're looking for is you know, value. The most common things I see is value that you have in other businesses, value that you have in rental property, or just cash CD brokerage accounts that you have that are that are cash accounts. Okay. Um, so most people don't have a problem with those three economic criteria, um, but you know that's what they're looking at. And you have to meet you have to meet both those economic and and socially disadvantaged to be a good candidate. And by a good candidate or unconditionally controlling candidate, I'm talking about a 51% or more owner of the firm. Okay, so that's the owner part. If you're in a situation where your company is not owned unconditionally by one person, let's say you have a company that's owned by three people, uh, 33 and a third each, in that scenario, you would have to have two of the three people qualify. So two out of the three owners would have to be socially and economically disadvantaged. That's an unusual application, you know, but you do see them, and you have to qualify a majority of the ownership uh, for the 8A. Okay. okay, so that's the owner. To look at the company, the SBA is looking for the company to have a potential for success, and they don't you know, there's not a nice bar that we can read, a federal, you know, regulation that we can read that says, hey, to be uh, to have a potential for success, you need to have these three things. It's, it's more of um, a common sense and just, just having done it for 10 years. But what they're looking for really, they like companies that are more than two years old. If you're less than two years old, you have to apply with a waiver, and we can talk about that a little bit in the future. But they like companies that are two, more than two years old and that are making money. That's kind of your ideal company. They, they like the company to have a positive, you know, for the owner to have positive equity in the company and for the company to have a positive working capital position, which means that the company has more current assets than it has current liabilities. They like for the company to not be economically dependent upon one client. That What that means is they're looking for you not to have more than 70% of your revenue coming from your largest client. Okay. If the company is less than two years old, they, they're going to require that it has at least one governmental client. If it's more than two years old, it can have, you know, can it be all governmental or all private sector or a combination of both. 
So basically, companies that are more than two years old that are making money that you know have left some profits in the firm and and have enough working capital that they can adequately operate in the in, in, in the industry they're working in. That's you know that's kind of what they're looking for as a company to have a potential for success. That's the basics of hey, does the company qualify and does does the unconditionally controlling owner qualify? There are some very common pitfalls to an, to an application that we can talk about a little bit. Um, the most common of which is what the SBA calls negative control. So there's so much value in getting an 8A application that a lot of people over the years have committed a lot of fraud in order to get one. And, you know, therefore the SBA keeps adding more and more regulations to try to try to combat that. And negative control is certainly the, the, the biggest one. And the whole purpose here is to make sure that the person that's claiming they own and are running the company really is the person that's owning and running the company. Okay. Um, so when I say negative control, what, what that means is that there's some other individual, typically a non-disadvantaged individual, that could potentially be in the background that might be really pull, holding the purse strings to this company or re- might really be um, operating the company and presenting the company as though it's owned by the socially disadvantaged individual, even though it's not in reality. Most common ways they look for something like that is to, you know, they'll want to see a copy of the lease that the company's operating under, and they'll want to look at that landlord and say, who is this person? Is this an arm's length transaction? They'll look at all the financing that the company has and, you know, look at any loans that the company has and make sure, hey, is this loan from, you know, a a typical financial institution or is this from an individual? And if it is from an individual, who is this individual? Why are they lending the company money? And is it at an arm's length type uh, transaction? or is there some sort of preferential tri- treatment in this, in this financing? They'll, they'll look at the company's equipment and say, who owns the equipment? Uh, if it's loaned, who's it loaned from? Or if it's rented, who's it rented from? So they really want to see in an ideal scenario that the company uh, is renting its office space from you know, a neutral third party and owns its equipment um, and is getting financing from a, a, a traditional institution. The the minority owners in a company also present that same same sort of potential for negative control. So um, when you have a company that's, let's say, 51% owned by the applicant but has a 49% minority owner, and by minority I just mean less than 50%. It can be a white person. It can be an African-American. It can be whatever. But somebody that doesn't own, you know, doesn't own 50%, so they're 49% or less owner, they're going to very critically look at that person and say, why? Why is this person here? What do they bring into the table? It's either expertise or money, or it doesn't make sense. And does this person have any abilities to potentially tell the owner what to do? You know, a common example of that would be a company that's being run by one individual, you know, 51% owned and run by one individual, as a, uh, let's say a general contracting firm. But the 49% owner of the firm is the one that actually holds the general contractor's license. Okay. The SBA would look at that and say, wait a second, we have a minority owner here that if they decide to quit and leave the company, the company has to shut down because they lose their critical license. That would be a classic example of a negative control in an application that they're not going to approve. Okay. So you know, those are kind of the highlight of what the SBA is looking for in terms of a company and an individual that, that make it a good application. Okay. So back up to the very beginning when you were talking about the individuals themselves, the categories of women can be considered as a minority and a, service, a disabled vet. Now, what about a person who who's certified as being handicapped? and they can be a Caucasian, does that qualify because they're still disabled or you have to be a disabled vet? It does qualify, yes. You can um, apply for 8A on the basis of just being handicapped, even if you aren't a vet. Um, let, let me go over real quick what the six possibilities are. Okay. You, you have cultural prejudice, handicap bias, ethnic prejudice, racial prejudice, gender bias, and geographical bias. Mm -hmm. So those are the six types of non-Pazoom group applications. 
Okay. The two I talked about were handicap bias with your disabled vets or or doesn't have to be a disabled vet uh, and gender bias. Those are by far the most common two. What I see probably is the third most common type is, and, and you'll see people call it one or the other, but either ethnic prejudice or racial prejudice. Usually I, I see it referred to as ethnic prejudice. But, you know, I've had, uh, oh, probably two or three clients a year that are from the Middle East. You know, they'll be from Jordan or they'll be from Turkey or Egypt or Saudi Arabia. And, you know, living in the United States post 9-11, it can be real difficult for that, uh, you know, racial group or that ethnic group. Um, so, you know, that that would be another type of application. The cultural prejudice and the geographical bias, those are extremely rare. Um, but I, I have, I've never personally done one. I have read some cases where they've been done, but okay. you're talking about um, an application that there might be one approved, you know, every three or four years. They're, they're that rare. The, the example I read was a white, Caucasian white gentleman that was living in Harlem. He was able to successfully make the argument that he was a minority in his, you know, in, in his neighborhood. And that's where he had been born and raised his whole life. And his business was a small local business that was only doing business in that community. And he was able to successfully argue that, um, you know, he had a, a, a geographical, I don't know, I, I don't know if he may have been using ethnic and geographical in that one, but you know he was able to argue that ultimately he was experiencing discrimination because of his, you know, because of because of his race and his ethnicity, and, and was able to get certified. Okay. Um, the geographical can be really rare, but I think I think where you would see that is somebody that's coming out of let's say the eastern hills of Tennessee or Kentucky, and you know have an extremely unique um, dialect or um, mannerisms that would make them stand out, even though they are Caucasian. Yeah, and, and this is what I was getting ready to bring about. You know, we're talking about the the really the hills of uh, West Virginia, which I mean we're talking about. It's a uh, functional. I mean, it, it, they have a. It's no difference than the Amish communities, and you know, uh, like in Kansas. But you go to the mountains and the hills of uh, West Virginia. You know, uh, they yeah, they're socially challenged economically. So will that person really qualify? Because you, I mean, I don't think the typical person will make over ten thousand a year. And will they, in that sense, can make that argument? I guess if they stay in that community, it's fine. I, I guess that can be an argument. Just be a devil advocate in that particular that person case. Has, you know, Tim, that person has the ability to apply. In, in theory, they should be successful. You know, if they're transplant from, you know, the West Virginia um, or, or Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky Mountains, you know, and they translate themselves, let's say, into um, Chicago or, uh, you know, some other Midwestern, let's say, Columbus, Ohio, and they're now living there, and, and, and they're a real outcast. You know, they stand out like a sore thumb, and they're being discriminated because they, you know, they talk funny and act funny and wear funny clothes. They would be able to write that narrative that gives stories about the discrimination they're experiencing because of their you know, because of their the, the, the way they are from from where they grew up, and, and and as long as they're able to write that narrative and give a preponderance of evidence of that chronically happening to them, they they should be successful. Okay. Tim, there's been a big shift in the way that these applications are being. Uh, critically examined or, or declined that I've seen in the last year and a half that probably merits a little bit of mention. Um, you know, for 30 years or so, the program has been designed to, to help socially and economically disadvantaged people. So what you've seen is a vast majority, 98 point something percent, that are a presumed group, and you've seen this 1.5 percent or so that that are, you know, Caucasian women and, and, and disabled vets mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, about a year and a half ago, though, you know, after the current administration got in there and kind of let their opinion be known to the SBA, you saw that type of application, the non presumed group application, all you, know, you saw those starting to get much more critically evaluated and, and held to such a high standard that um, very few are being approved anymore. 
Last year, in 2011, we only saw 21 Caucasian women, you know, gender bias, non presume group applications get certified. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that is a significant decrease from what that number has been historically. You know, historically, we were seeing numbers anywhere from 60 to, well, I think the highest number I saw was 84. So, you know, you can see um, there's been a lot more pressure put on those type applications, and it really is, if, if you have, if you're thinking about applying for 8A and you are not seriously, you know, honestly be experiencing discrimination because of your gender, you know, don't waste your time applying because you, you are going to be held to a very high um, evidence threshold there. You know, we're going to want to see, when we do one in that narrative, we require at least eight stories. We want four of them that talk about discrimination that you've experienced since you've been running your firm. Mm-hmm. We want two stories that talk about discrimination you've experienced because of your gender out of prior employers. And then we want one story that talks about it from access to credit and one story that talks about it from education. So, you know, to try to fake that kind of that that kind of story is 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 really it's not going to be it's not going to happen. Um, so, you know, I, I really don't want to suggest to people, hey, you're you know you're a Caucasian female, you can get eight A certified, because uh, it's just not the case anymore. You really have to you really have to be experiencing this type of discrimination, or you know, I wouldn't recommend uh, the energy and time to to put into a to put into an 8A application. Okay. We have a couple of questions. One question is for nonprofits. Can nonprofits be uh, 8A certified? There is a very unique way that you can do a nonprofit. The, the, the basic answer is no. The 8A program is designed to help for-profit businesses uh, by giving them the preferential treatment. The exception to that is something called an Alaskan Native Corporation or Community Development Corporations. Okay. So, you know, here in Cincinnati, for example, we have uh, quite a few of these community development uh, corporations, you know, Clifton Heights Community Development Corporation, and you'll see every city's got them. So those community development corporations can own a, let's say, an S-Corp or a C-Corp or an LLC, you know, some sort of for-profit entity. Mm-hmm. And that for-profit entity can be managed by an employee and can apply for 8A certification and can get awarded 8A certification. Um, of course, the profits from that entity are flowing through to a nonprofit. That's the way you would have to do it. Okay. So will a person have to still be on the application, have to be still 51% or because of that nonprofit or because where is local? The nonprofit would have to be a 51% owner of the applicant concern. Okay. Excuse me. The Community Development Corporation okay. or the Alaskan Native Corporation would have to own 51% or more of the for-profit 8A applicant concern. Okay. Okay. So, okay, because it is a community development. Okay. Yeah, I kind of see that now. Okay. Well, that, that was a good question on that one. And I think the other one, uh, he had a question regarding construction for women. Uh, he says, traditionally, women in construction, I'm trying to phrase this real quick because it's pretty long. So if you're a woman and you're in the construction business, and we, we know you have the good old boys, if you have a construction company, they're not going to necessarily give you a contract easy. You're going to have to really work hard for that. So you, are you saying, when you mentioned earlier, that in the past it was a lot easier for a woman that owned a construction business, for example, and you know you can show kind of discrimination on that. You say now it's a little bit harder. You just want eight stories to show why a woman is being disadvantaged for the application. Tim, it's a, it's a terrific question, and it really is the heart of gender bias type applications. Okay. Uh, by that I mean traditionally when we're doing a gender bias application, that is, you know that we're successful with it's almost always a woman-owned construction business. Okay. It is a very easy to understand area where a woman is going to get discriminated against. It's easy to get stories about. Everybody understands it. We all know there's a good boys network when it comes to construction, uh, and that's something that the SBA you know um, has seen a lot of and and is the most common type certification. 
the you know the reality that the uh, that that application's gotten a lot more difficult you know is, is certainly true. Um, last year we did you know Easy 8A did um, four of the 21. We had four gender bias applications that we were successful with getting certified out of the 21 that were done, um, and all four of those were construction companies. Wow. Um, you know, so that is, it, it's certainly the most common area that, that you'll see that successfully done in. Okay. The last two questions. One question say, can you have two certifications or should you submit two certifications at the same time? So I'm guessing he has two businesses and he wants them to get both certified. Is that recommended? Right, let's, talk a, let's talk a, a little bit about that, Tim. The, okay. You know, the SBA has four different certifications. So essentially the federal government has four certifications that they offer to people, to okay. companies that are trying to do government contracting. You can certainly have two of those at once. You can have all four of them at once. However, you cannot have more than one 8A certification. So if you own two companies, you can get both those companies certified in the other three certifications except for 8A. When it comes to 8A, 8A is unique in the fact that it is a once-in-a-lifetime certification for an individual and a once-in-a-lifetime certification for a, for a legal entity, for a company. Wow. So once you qualify a company as 8A certified, that's the only company you are ever in your life going to certify, and then you only get to keep that company in the program for nine years. And then you will be forced, you know, what they call graduated. Okay. The um, it's probably it probably is worth taking a moment here to just give everybody a ten second overview on on what the other certifications are that the federal government offers. Thank you. Um, to go over them real quick, you have the service disabled veteran owned small business, the SDVOSB. That you know, just like it sounds, that is designed to help um, veterans of the U.S. military to get preferential treatment doing um, government contracting. The veteran must be service disabled, so they must have a DD-214 with some sort of service disability rating. The second certification uh, is a hub zone certification, which um, the acronym is historically underutilized business zone. In order to get a hub zone certification for your, your firm, the firm must be located in a hub zone. Typically, hub zones are are the poor parts of, of any county or city. So if, if the business is located in a hub zone and has 35% of its employees that live in hub zones, then it would qualify to get a hub zone certification. Okay. The third certification they offer is a woman-owned small business. That has two two parts to it. It can either be a woman-owned small business or an economically disadvantaged woman-owned small business. The criteria to have it be an economically disadvantaged um, woman-owned small business is that the, the unconditionally controlling owner must have less than $6 million in assets, less than $750,000 in adjusted net worth, and be earning less than $350,000 a year. Mm-hmm. So most most businesses are going to qualify as you know uh, economically disadvantaged. The thing that makes that woman-owned small business certification tough is that they only allow you to do it in 83 different NACE codes. So unless your business is in an industry which the government has decided has been historically underrepresented by women or historically substantially underrepresented by women, you can't get the certification, even if you are 100% woman-owned. Okay. And finally, the last one, of course, is 8A. So those are the, you know, ultimately those are the four opportunities that are available to business owners, um, you know, that are looking to do uh, government contracting. Okay. And let's talk about your company, that what your company offers uh, in the certification uh, process. I appreciate that, Tim. The, you know, Easy 8A is... We're full service 8A, and you know the 8A really is the, our core competency. It's what the business was developed doing, as you can guess from its name. Uh, we've been doing it for about 10 years, and you know our most common thing is to do an entire application for clients. So they'll hire us for $3,950 to do the entire application. So we'll take them from the you know beginning and all, all the way through building the entire application form and mailing it off to the SBA. So, um, you know, ultimately we we have a screening process whereby you know, we, we spend about an hour and a half with the potential client and go through every little aspect of their business with them and of, of an application with them, make sure they're a good client, a good candidate for the 
certification and and if they are then you know we move forward and, and, and do it for them and if we don't then there's no cost to them and we um you know, give them some feedback on what they need to do to become a good candidate and, and uh, you know, hopefully hear back from them when those issues have been resolved. There are other services out there relating to A-Day, um, n- none of which are, are probably important at this stage, but once a client gets A-Day certified, they have to do annual renewals. We do that for them. Um, they have to write a business plan, which, you know, is a service that we offer to them. If if somebody tries to apply on their own and gets declined, they can do a reconsideration, which we do for clients. So, you know, those are all kind of ancillary uh, services that we have. We even have clients, and, and surprisingly enough, it's not very many, uh, maybe half a dozen a year or a dozen a year that will hire us just to uh, – counsel them essentially through doing it on their own. So, you know, they'll call us and ask us questions and then ultimately send us the application and we'll review it for them before they mail it off and give them feedback on it. So, you know, that's all the way from the just the minimal help, like uh, doing a review from somebody all the way through doing, you know, every aspect of uh, of the certification form. Okay. So the process itself, it, is it a thick application? Is it paper or is it electronic-based? And once you get in-house, how long does it normally take for you guys to turn around to send it to the government? And I know you mentioned it takes about 90 days to get, a, get an answer back. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, of course. The, the SBA has gotten a lot, you know, as all the government entities are trying to do. Uh, they've gotten a lot more organized in the last 10 years, and we now have an online area where we key in all the, the basic information. What's misleading is people go online and say, oh, look at this application. It's not too bad. It's only 10 or 20 pages. We fill it out online and submit it. And that's true, but it's only about 5% of the work that's involved in an application. The, 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 the big part of it is all done by paper, unfortunately, still. And what we do is put together a three-ring binder. It's usually about three or four inches thick. It'll have 42 chapters to it that'll, you know, all be tabbed on a table of contents. But, you know, all that supporting documentation, you know, writing the narratives and doing the financial analysis on the, you know, on the historical statements and the current statement and, and, and presenting that to them, you know, with all the supporting docs in such a way that it's, you know, that it's uh, something they're going to understand. It really is the key parts to it. And, and um, you know, I've had applications that are as thin as two inches, and I've had some that are, you know, whether it be four, three inch, four, three ring, three inch, three ring binders. You know, we have an application that's a foot thick. So, you know, it varies, but, you know, generally you're talking about a significant, a significant amount of paper that goes into an application. And, and it typically takes us three or four weeks to put one together. So, it, you know, it's a, it's a big job. Okay. <laughs> so it takes usually about, uh, about three or four weeks if you finish the cont- uh, entire packet. And then from that point, you guys just meld those important documents to the SBA. And uh, it takes 90 days for the SBA to get back with you, or it happens pretty quick? Or no, it- you've got it pretty good. You're, you're looking at, a, at four months from the day you start with us till the you know till the day you're going to hear back from the SBA. That's a very typical type of time frame. Okay. And if the SBA need clarification on something, does the clock stop and you start over, or they just pick up where you left off as in time? Great question. The, the SBA historically, you know, they have a 90-day reg- regulatory requirement to respond to these applications, and in the past they've been pretty good about doing that. Um, they do they do come up with every excuse under the sun to turn that 90-day clock off. Uh, so every time we send them an application, they'll, they'll always send back an email a couple weeks later with some questions in it, and they'll turn off their clock the entire time you know, you're responding to those questions. They'll turn off the clock if it's not unusual for them right before they certify to come back with a question or two. They'll turn off the clock while while that's happening. If you know if the applicant has a criminal background, if the applicant's ever been arrested, then you know there's a, a criminal background disclosure that gets done uh, by the FBI, and the SBA turns off their 90-day clock while that background check's being done, which can take two months or three months sometimes. Um, they'll also turn off the background, the 90-day clock, if your company needs a size determination done because it's affiliated with another company. You name it, they'll turn off the clock for, you know, for a lot of different reasons. You know, horror stories. I've had a, I had a client a, a little bit ago that it took them 18 months to approve their application. 
and you know, never got denied or anything. It's just that's how long it took them to approve it. I've had um, applications where they get approved in less than a month. So you know, it it, it really can vary tremendously. Wow. So uh, this for devil's advocate talking about the one that doing the felon the uh, background check. So part of this whole process, they they will do a, a background check on the owners or the people on the application. Or yeah, I've you know I've kind of hit the highlights of um, what it takes to be a good applicant for for eight A. I certainly haven't hit every last detail. One of the details that is in there is what's called a good moral character requirement for the applicant. Okay. So they are going to run a, a background check on the applicant. They're also going to run a, um, you know, a, a personal credit check on the applicant and on the on the applicant concern to make sure that there's no issues there. They're going to ask for copies of any lawsuits that the company or the applicant have ever been involved in so they can have an understanding of what, you know, what was being accused of, of the applicant or the company in, in those cases. Wow. So you know they they are very thorough on that good moral character requirement. Okay. Okay. Great. And if so, just expect if you do have those any issues, lawsuits or whatever, or tax, then uh, be able to explain that. It's going to take a, a while. It's going to be beyond four months before you get this whole process done. So be yeah, it can It really can be. The SBA has um, been patting themselves on the back recently that they have implemented a new system with the FBI where they're streamlining these background checks. And supposedly that's going to take what used to take two months down to taking a week. Um, I haven't seen that yet, but... Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, I, I don't want to knock them. Hopefully, that's happening, and, and we'll see that we'll see that part speed up a little bit. Okay, I guess in closing, anything you would like to close with about yourself, your company, what you guys can provide in helping small businesses to uh, become 8A certified or helping with the other certification? You know, Tim, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and your guests. I I, I don't know that there is a lot to say uh, in closing. Certainly, if you're looking to do an 8A certification, I think my big piece of advice to you is to call us or you know, go on our website at easy8a.com. That's the letter E, the letter Z is in Zulu, then 8, then A is in Alpha, just the four characters. Go on to easy8a.com, read a little bit, and call us. And in 10 minutes, we can, you know, we can give you a very good idea of, hey, you're wasting your time or you're not wasting your time or, you know, have you evaluated doing something a little differently? And, and you know, we're not going to charge you for that call. And um, you'll, you'll really, in a lot of cases, save yourself a lot of work in, 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 in identifying what your problems are and, and kind of um, knowing whether or not you should be moving forward or not. It's, it's it's interesting. A big chunk of our business here, and by a big chunk, I mean probably 25% of our business is doing appeals for people that don't hire us initially. You know, they try it themselves and get denied, and they want to hire us to fix it. And in probably half of those cases, I can look at their application and in three minutes tell them this has no chance of ever being successful. You know, I know you have 200 hours into putting this together, but... You know, if you had just called me in, in five minutes, I could have told you not to waste your time. So um, that's probably the biggest thing is just, to, you know, give us a call and we'll, we'll give you a quick assessment whether or not, you know, you really should, whether or not your company makes sense, whether or not you make sense, and whether or not the industry you're in makes sense, you know, to be to be spending the effort to get a certification. Okay. Um, how can they contact you? Uh, I know you mentioned your website again. So can you uh, give us a, your website address again? It's the letter E is in Echo, the letter Z is in Zulu, the number 8, and the letter A is in Alpha. So EZ8A.com. Our phone number is uh, plastered all over the site, but it's 513-843-4288. Okay, and you're out of Cincinnati? We're in Cincinnati, Ohio, yep. Okay, so you're in uh, East Coast time. Again, that number is 513-843-4288? You got it. Okay, great. Again, Mark, I really appreciate you coming to the program. And again, Mark Ryan, Managing Partner at Easy 8A, right? Dr. Got it, Tim. All right. It's a pleasure. Thank you for coming on the program, and I appreciate I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Have a good one, guys. Great. Have a great day. 
This has been another broadcast of Financing Your Business Today with Apple Capital Group. You can download this episode on iTunes or you can download it on Blog Talk Radio. Thank you for joining the program and uh, have a great day. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For more information about equipment financing and asset-based loans, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. Or call us at 866-611-7457. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to The Core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. And thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.